Hello and a very warm welcome to the virtual BLSI philosophy program. My name is Andreas Wasmuth and I'm the co-convener for philosophy at the BLSI. The Meaning of Existence, subtitled Being and Becoming, is a mini-series of five talks based on the lecture that I delivered at the BLSI some three years ago. Retrospectively thinking about it, it was sheer hubris to attempt to cover the meaning of existence in one lecture, hence the creation of this series. You may ask, what is all the fuss about? The answer can be found in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and Monty Python's The Meaning of Life. In Douglas's Adams' masterpiece, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it took the supercomputer deep thought seven and a half million years to come up with 42 as the answer to life, the universe and everything, without knowing what the question he was asked was. In the meaning of life, the meaning of existence is equally as profound as expounded by Michael Palin, and he defines it as, well, it's nothing very special. Hmm. Try to be nice to people, avoid eating fat, read a good book every now and then, get some walking in and try to live together in peace and harmony with people of all creeds and nations. The need for a mini-series seems to suggest that it's more complicated than that. And here is what we will cover. First of all, part one, which is going to be uh, covering today, is from ritual to religion. This will cover common responses to the questions to the meaning of existence. Secondly, we're going to be exploring the prehistoric background and context. And then finally, we'll be finishing today with moving from ritual to religion. So this is the first part and the first lecture on the meaning of life, uh, a meaning of existence, being and becoming. The second part, which will be another lecture, is going to be the transition from revelation to investigation and the birth of philosophy. Here we will cover the ancient philosophy in the West as well as scholasticism and the synthesis of religion and philosophy. Part three will be an exploration of the ancient philosophical wisdom of the East and that includes India and China in particular. Part four will be about the Enlightenment philosophy and modern philosophy in the West in particular. And that will cover things like liberalism to existentialism. And in part five, we'll explore the problems of philosophy. And by that, I mean not the problems, uh, the challenges and the topics being explored by philosophy, but I mean by that actually the problems with philosophy as a subject and also as a way of exploring things like the meaning of existence. And I dare to offer a new perspective on the subject. Okay, the final thing in series five is covered from absolutism and relativism to what I would like to call a relationality. And that's where the mini-series will end. Now, there's many common responses to the question of the meaning of existence uh, within philosophy and also outside philosophy. First of all, the question is meaningless. And here is we can't even talk about uh, questions of the meaning of existence because it is too, too remote, too abstract. It is not something that we can find in the world. And here you find philosophies like the uh, Vienna Circle and logical positivism, uh, Wittgensteinian's linguistics and some of analytical philosophy. These concepts, the meaning of existence, literally lies outside the realm of logic and language. Uh, and that is one of the things that we will be exploring later on in the course. The second answer to the question is an absolute answer exists. There is an absolute and mainly, mostly single answer to the question what the meaning of existence is. And here we find ourselves in the realm of religion, 
uh, Platonism, mysticism, and even nihilism. I mean, nihilism is to some extent the odd word out in this uh, in this group because nihilism is actually it refuses to actually accept that there is a meaning of uh, existence as a whole. Meaning meaning is not derived. Existence is meaningless. But even that is an absolute answer to the question of what is the meaning of existence. The third one is that the answer is beyond human thought. And this is really where we meet uh, Wittgenstein of the Tractatus uh, and also uh, Kantian philosophy. For Kant, the world is split into two. The noumenal world, which is the world as it really is, of which we can know very little, and the phenomenal world is the world we encounter and experience. And that's the only thing we can really say about the world and also the meaning of our existence. Wittgenstein of the Tractatus, which is the earlier Wittgenstein, is the limit of my language is the limit of my world. So, and he understands that concepts such as the meaning of existence and, and uh, God, for example, are very real uh, concepts and issues. He just means that they are mystical, that's what he says in the Tractatus, because they are beyond his logical and linguistic uh, world. Uh, the fourth category, an answer to the question, is the answer is to whatever you want it to be. And here we find relativism and existentialism. Now, as far as uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and probably the most famous existentialist is concerned, uh, essence is preceded by existence. We come to exist first and then we define our essence or our meaning of existence in, in our lives. And therefore, it is something that comes from us individually rather than something that's bestowed upon us by someone else. And likewise, uh, relativism uh, is exactly in the same kind of area with Protagoras famously in, in Greek saying, man is the measure of all things. And therefore, what we want our meaning of existence to be is up to us. And then finally, the, another way is that meaning is actually an existent, existing and emergent property of our interactions with each other and with the world. And this is one of the things that we will be exploring as part of the fifth uh, lecture in this particular series. And then finally, of course, you might ask, who cares? You know, this is this is a common response that most people make to what is the uh, meaning of existence. Who cares? I'm leading my life just fine. And therefore, this is not a relevant question for me. Right. Well, let's move on to the prehistoric context, which I think is extremely important. Now, the prehistoric context starts various notions of humanity to be able to ask those kind of questions in the first place. Uh, we believe, for example, that we are the only species on the planet that has the capability and the curiosity to actually ask questions like, what is the meaning of existence? And abstract thought comes from the word abstere, to draw away from, and is explored by uh, Carl Gustav Jung, the psychologist, and also Immanuel Kant. It's about the ability to formate, uh, form concepts, principles and schemas extending to imagination and planning. And that is believed to have arisen uh, from evolution between 100,000 to 50,000 uh, years ago. So quite a recent arrival in terms of its complexity uh, on, on the scene. As far as complex language is concerned, the very famous Noam Chomsky also and believes that actually complex language derived in uh, through uh, human thought is quite a recent uh, evolutionary mutation dating back to about 200,000 to 60,000 uh, BCE. So again, quite recent. But we have found physical evidence in burials and rituals uh, around the world uh, that actually show 
uh, some of these abstract thoughts and complex language, even if it wasn't written or it was, uh, you know, proto hieroglyphs, etc., depictions of animals. So one of su such things is the school cave in Kafsez in Israel or Palestine, which dates back a hundred thousand years or so of depiction of uh, people's lives in uh, caves. Uh, likewise, there is the Maros Cave in Sulawesi in Indonesia, where similar artwork can be seen from something like 38,900 uh, BCE. Um, cave drawings and representations are also evident in the Lascaux Caves in France from about 17,000 years ago, explaining explanation of existence and through fertility add another a dimension to this and this covers things like the Venus of Hohlefels discovered in Germany which is a Venus figure of fertility dating back to some 35,000 years and then finally uh, metaphysical myths and this goes back to the Aboriginal dream times from about between 30,000 to 20,000 uh, BCE. And uh, these have been paintings and drawings have been found in the Carnarvon Gorge in Queensland, Australia, about 30,000 years ago, and the uh, depicting the creation myth and the rainbow serpent. So there's lots of prehistoric content where people have asked themselves questions about their existence in the land and in the environment they were living and the species and animals they were living with. Uh, burial rites in particular uh, seem to be quite interesting but because it does hint at abstract concepts such as an afterlife, uh, having burial rites and, and placing bodies in certain places, uh, assuming that uh, they would be going on a journey to somewhere. So, how do we get how do we get from ritual uh, to religion, and what are the sort of common themes and differences? I suppose. The meaning of existence in religion is very often in relation to a divine supreme being who, that creates, regulates and defines meaning in our lives. Ritualistic behaviour hints at codes of conduct that contain abstract notions of existence, human expression and consider considerations of death and the afterlife. The transition to religion occurs with the profession to be the truth in relation to existence and its meaning within its own scriptures and doctrines. Now, religion, we have a divine beginning, or at least a divine inspired beginning, if you are a deist. In theism, the involvement of the divine in the universe is continuous and eternal. And the, the rationale for religion is to create order out of chaos, to provide a modus operandum in terms of how we can move forward as a society. And the purpose of meaning of existence is based on revelation and faith. This is something that has been bestowed upon us. This is not something that we will discover ourselves, but it is by us acting in certain ways in certain, with certain concepts and also in certain contexts that actually define whether we are living uh, our life and our existence has meaning in a religious context. And th this means that life is, is, is commanded and decreed uh, in, in obviously in Christianity and in Judaism, we know about the Ten Commandments in terms of providing guidance uh, in terms of how to live, both prohibitive and affirmative uh, commandments. And the prohibitive tenets do not define the meaning of existence. It is basically telling us what we shouldn't do rather than what we should do. And actually, uh, when you look at uh, many religions, the prohibitive tenets are far greater in number than the positive uh, tenets such as the golden rule which we come to later uh, which is treat others like you would like to be treated yourself or love thy neighbor as yourself those are kind of things that are more positive and actually give more of a sense of the meaning of existence yes so you know 
the golden rule that I just prescribed, that I just described, prescribe a code of conduct, how to lead your life for it to have uh, meaning. Okay, and then living in accordance with the divine includes rituals, practices, beliefs, and adherence to key tenets. Now, the Western religious focus is predominantly externally focused towards the, a god, whereas in the East, the focus is actually mainly internally focused, and the belief is that actually the individual is a manifestation of the universe as a whole. Okay, so I mean, in terms of some of the religions, it might be worthwhile just exploring uh, different ones because they vary quite significantly uh, across the piece. So Mesopotamia is very rich and contains uh, the one of the oldest, if not the oldest, uh, culture uh, that uh, has been discovered, the Sumerian culture, and it covers uh, various. Uh, uh, religious explorations in terms of reality. Now, for example, you have got Anu, the god Anu, who is the firmament, and the god Ki, who is represented by Earth, and the primordial beings gave rise to Enki, who gave rise to humans, or Adapa, in the Garden of Eden, which means flat terrain, from the blood of a god with clay. So this is the creation myth, and the Enuma Elish is the Mesopotamian creation story, a mixture of Apsu and Tiamat. Two gods were made, Lamu and Lahamu. Next came Ansha, and Kisha was created, eventually leading to Marduk, the overlord of the gods. And likewise, it also covers the Epic of Gilgamesh, circa 2100 BCE, which covers the Mesopotamian flood story and Utnapishtim. So very old religious texts, in fact only second oldest to the pyramid text, which we come to in a second. Now the meaning of life in Sumeria and in Mesopotamia was for humanity to serve the gods. And only by serving the gods and appeasing the gods and making sacrifices could order be created out of chaos. As far as the Egyptian uh, religious mythology is concerned, we start off with the pyramid texts going back to about 2400 BCE. And a central text thereafter is the Book of the Dead from about uh, 1500 BCE. Now, as far as the Egyptian mythology in religion is concerned, in the darkness and the chaos, Heka awaited creation. Out of it arose Atum on the hill Benben and made it with a shadow to create Shu, god of air and life, and Tefnut, the goddess of moisture and order. Atum shed tears of joy, which created humans, and Shu and Tefnut made it to produce Geb which is earth, and Nut, which is night, followed by the pantheon of Egyptian gods. The pyramid texts are spells enabling the transformation of the deceased into an ark, where those judged worthy could mix with the gods. So in Egyptian uh, religion, it is a journey Life is the meaning of life or meaning of existence is a journey through eternity, which is mirrored in this life. It is a journey you will take uh, several times. And therefore, how you behave in this world is fundamentally of importance and gives you meaning to your existence. And then finally, Zoroastrianism, which again is, is a very ancient uh, religion dating back to about 1500 BCE uh, to its founder uh, Zarathustra or Zoroaster. And the Avestas are the key uh, uh, texts and the hymns, the Gathas, which is a significant uh, text to actually depict the behaviors that are expected of a Zoroastrian. Now, Zoroastrians have a very different view of uh, a god, Ahura Mazda, um, because he, humanity isn't there to serve the gods, as it is in the Sumerian uh, religion, but it is God's helper. And the key guide to Zoroastrians are the three key tenets of 
good words, good thoughts and good deeds. These are the things, these are the things that provide meaning to your existence. How you are in the world, how you think about things, how you talk to people and your actions in life that define the meaning of your existence. We now turn uh, to the Eastern religions and uh, the main three, but there's obviously many others which we can explore at another juncture. I'm talking this time about Hinduism, Buddhism and Taoism. Now, Hinduism, in the first case, is the oldest uh, writings there, is the Rig Veda from about 1500 BCE. Uh, the Upanishads follow in 600 BCE. And uh, the, uh, the most famous uh, accounts within Hinduism are the Mahabharata and the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, which, is, which is a subset of the Mahabharata. And in Hinduism, the Purushatras are very important. They are basically the, the, the meaning of existence. They include karma, which is pleasure and joy, arta, which is wealth and prosperity, dharma, which is duty, but also translated as virtue, moksha, which is the liberation from samsara and karma, and rebirth and moksha are, have only been in place really since the Upanishads in about since 600 uh, BCE. Shiva is the, uh, the trinity, the Indian trinity is the Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver, and Shiva, the destroyer. And the four stages of life are student, householder, forest dweller, and renouncer. So quite a rich context uh, which to explore. We will do this in a subsequent uh, lecture when we actually focus on the wisdom of the East and Eastern religion. Buddhism is, is probably the best known in the West and probably the most practiced in the West. And it includes uh, concepts such as Nirvana and the release from Dukkha. Now, dukkha is suffering and pain. And the key concepts and accounts in Buddhism are the uh, Four Noble Truths. And the Four Noble Truths are one, that uh, suffering, dukkha, exists and is, is the origin of our craving. Uh, this, uh, the, the, what causes suffering is craving and attachment to things. And the cessation of suffering, niroda, is the way to release and become, uh, is, is, is achieve the cessation of suffering, to actually go to the true, true path of maga, of release from suffering. Now, the three jewels in Buddhism are the Buddha, the Dharma, which is duty or virtue, and Sangha, which is the community. So Buddhism, again, comes in many different forms, and we'll come back to Buddhism uh, as part of the uh, wisdom from the East, because it also has significant philosophical uh, implications. And finally, in the Chinese tradition, uh, Taoism, again, a very uh, old religion uh, and, and also philosophy, dating back depending on interpretations anywhere from 1200 BCE to probably more likely to be around 500 BCE in terms of a, a at the same time as, as Confucianism. Now, the Tao Te Ching, which is the power in its way, is the main text here. The story goes that this was actually produced by Lao Tse, a wise man during the warring, uh, warring states uh, period in China, uh, who wanted to leave to lead a simple life uh, with nature, and was stopped at the border by a border guard who asked him to write down his wisdom before he left for pastures new. He did that in supposedly overnight, and then went on his way. The result of that is the Tao Te Ching. And this is uh, several hundred verses and guidance in terms of how to live in harmony with nature uh, and how to achieve immortality. In Taoism, it is actually the idea is that you could actually become an immortal depending on how you lead your life in reality. 
So these are the, the main Eastern religion. Obviously, it would be very amiss of me if I missed out uh, the Western and Abrahamic religions. So here they are. And we obviously have the three main Abrahamic religions. One is obviously Judaism, followed by Christianity, and, and finally Islam. Now, Judaism, uh, the main accounts are in the Tanakh, uh, including the Torah and the Mitzvot, the Naim and the Kutuvim. And the meaning of existence is a covenant with God and Yahu, Yahweh, and uh, the commandments and the Tikkun, Tikkun Olam, which is fixing the world, are key tenets to lead your life by. Uh, we've talked about the commandments uh, already earlier in terms of uh, a guide to lead your life. Now, the Judaism also, the key values in Judaism are justice, compassion, peace, kindness, hard work, prosperity, humility, and education. And these are the kind of messages you find infused in all of the uh, myths and scriptures within Judaism. Christianity, of course, has the Old and the New Testament. The Old Testament is predominantly, obviously, the adoption of the Jewish Torah. And it's just, uh, you know, it, it, that's it derived and adopted from Judaism. And the New Testament and its teachings are really the teachings of Jesus, such as the Golden Rule, which we talked about, treating others how you would like to be treated yourself, and love thy neighbor as yourself. Those are the kind of uh, key uh, tenets within Christianity. And again, there's different forms and different denominations, and uh, we unfortunately don't have time to go through all of that uh, now. Uh, and finally, in Islam, which dates back to, back to about 600 uh, uh, in the Common Era, so significant later than both Judaism and Christianity, the main uh, scriptures are the Quran and the Hadith. And the key uh, tenets and meanings are the five pillars of Islam, which is Shahada, which is the profession of faith, that there's only one God. And uh, uh, the second thing is Salat, the ritual prayer. Third is Sakha, which is charity. Fourthly is Swam, which is Psalm, uh, which is fasting during Ramadan. And then the Hajj, which is the pilgrimage to uh, Mecca. Those are the key uh, tenets and key obligations that every Muslim has to fulfill. So this hopefully will give you a good overview in terms of some of the religious context uh, in terms of the meaning of existence. I think what I want to do next time is actually go through and take you to another uh, lecture which then moves us forward from uh, the focus of religion to moving forward in terms of meaning and existence, being and becoming, to a move to philosophy where we will explore some of the Western early philosophies and end with scholasticism in uh, the Middle Ages. I hope you enjoy this particular uh, talk and I hope you will be back for more in the coming weeks. I see you then. Bye bye.